30 Days of Night is a film about a small Alaskan town overrun by vampires. These vampires take advantage of 30 days of no sunlight due to the town's extreme northern latitude. In the absence of sunlight, they go on an uninterrupted murder rampage. The town of 152 is cut down to a handful of survivors who make it due to luck, trench diggers, and vampire blood performance enhancers. Do you think you'd be one of the survivors? Do you think you'd have the skills, cunning, and knowledge to take out a vampire clan who's lived a hundred lifetimes? You do? Well, you're wrong, and I'm here to tell you why. In fact, contrary to how this film ends, no one in this town is going to see sunlight again. I'm going to make sure of that. That cold ain't the weather. That's death approaching. In this video from Strange Thoughts, I'll tell you why you wouldn't survive 30 days of night. First, a disclaimer. This is not a how to beat video. Any idea I propose for your survival will only set you up for a more gruesome death later in the film. I'm going to explain in painful detail all the points you wouldn't make it as we progress through the movie. In addition to highlighting the deaths the original writers covered, I'll introduce some they missed. If your ego can't take it, go watch a how to beat video. Still here? Great. Let's look at how your miserable life comes to an end. Game! Welcome to Barrow, Alaska. This small town is the northernmost city in the United States. It is really far north, like north of the Arctic Circle north and makes Anchorage look like a tropical paradise. For most of the year, the city hovers around 500 plus residents who are mostly there to support the oil industry. Town amenities include Eco's Diner, the best place in town for some polar bear or whale meat, the general store, an assortment of goods ranging from bear mace and traps to Oreos, the sheriff station, an institute of law and order incorruptible by the vampire nation. Kelso's Attic, a great hiding spot for a game of vampire hide and seek. The Utilidor, built like Fort Knox, this place is the most hardened building in the city and where you want to be if bad stuff is going down. The city's claim to fame is its polar winter. Due to its latitude, for one month of the year, there is zero sunlight. As no roads connect Barrow to the nearest town 90 miles away, those who stay for the polar winter are essentially stranded on a snow island island for 30 days. This makes it the perfect place for a group of vampires to show up and get their blood sucking on. The main characters in the film include Josh Hartnett, the town sheriff. Josh moved to Barrow, Alaska after a traumatic high school experience in which he helped Frodo Baggins and Mia Toretto take down an alien species infesting their school. There is a documentary out there about this called The Faculty if you're interested in learning more. Stella, Josh's estranged wife and town fire marshal. Billy, the sheriff's deputy and close friend of Josh. Bo, the rough and tough snowplow driver who just got back from filming Ice Road Truckers season 5. And finally, Josh's brother and mother, the town's only drug dealers, slinging dope behind Josh's back. What the hell is that? Oh. It's pot. It helps her with her cancer. Didn't tell you I got a little greenhouse at home. Didn't want you arresting me. The movie doesn't give you much of a backstory on the vampires, so let me fill in the details. A vampire named Marlo, tired of seeing his fellow vampires slaughtered by Blade, learns of a town in Alaska that has no sunlight for 30 days. This is the vacation he's been looking for. No blade, no lichens, just a healthy plate of human meat. He convinces a small group of other vampires to help him hijack a cargo ship and they head north. Along the way, they pick up some human bozo who didn't make the cut on the deadliest catch and promise to turn him if he helps them with their plans. They're coming. This time they're gonna take me with them. All of me. Yeah. For all that I have done. Now that we know the settings and the characters, let's move on to how you die. Most horror movies can be divided into three rounds of death slash survival, so that's how we'll conduct our analysis. In round one, we'll get rid of the majority who are unlucky and or physically weak. Round two will eliminate the mentally weak and those with a hero complex, and round three will take out the assholes and those with true grit. In some horror movies, a handful of characters make it past round three, as in this film. However, that's usually to give the viewer, you, 
a false sense of hope that you would make it if placed in a similar scenario. I'm here to dismantle this false narrative and remind you at every step that you will not survive 30 days of night. Before we even get to round one, there is the potential for you to die. After all, you do live in one of the most remote, darkest, and dangerous places in the world. Even in the absence of vampires, your life expectancy isn't exactly at the top of the charts. Let's take one such example provided by the film. While most of the town decides to leave during the 30 days of polar night, you and 152 other townspeople decide to stick around. After dropping your loved ones off at the airport, you get T-boned by a runaway trench digger. In a scene straight out of Final Destination, the trencher, which is still running when it hits your car, just about saws you in half. <laughs> The clock is now ticking for the vampires as they will have to kill you before death itself finds a gory way to claim your life. After your little run in with the ditch digger, you decide to celebrate your new lease on life with a polar bear steak at the local diner. As you are sitting there drinking coffee and swapping stories about polar bear attacks, last sunset dates, and run ins with the trencher, the stage is being set for your impending doom. Unbeknownst to you, some master thief the film labels as The Stranger is stealing every satellite phone in town. In between each heist, he's also killing all the sled dogs and vandalizing the town's only helicopter. I really have to give it to this guy. I know I called him a bozo earlier, but I don't think many of us would be able to accomplish half the stuff he did without being caught. If there's an Ocean's 14, George Clooney knows who to call. You think we need one more? You think we need one more? All right, we'll get one more. While the stranger is getting his vandalism on, the vampires start on their way to town. They've been fasting for a long time and are ready to feed. Back at the diner, your first inkling that something may be wrong comes as the stranger from out of town shows up and starts talking about how much he likes fresh meat. After the waitress tells him they don't serve raw beef, he gets angry and starts causing a scene. As you're listening to rumors about vandalized helicopters, murdered sled dogs, and missing satellite phones, you start to wonder if this stranger is responsible. Just then, the land Line, internet, and electricity go out. This is the first moment you realize you may be in trouble. While your mind starts racing through potential explanations, not once do you think of a vampire takeover. Aliens maybe, but not vampires. Your thoughts are interrupted by the sheriff coming through town telling you to go home, lock your doors, and load your firearms. Yeah, something's definitely not right. Before you have a chance to think or do anything else, round one of the carnage begins. <laughs> The vampires attack with the bloodthirst equivalent of consuming nothing but saltine crackers for a week. They appear seemingly out of nowhere, jumping off buildings like parkour athletes and taking down humans with the skill of an MMA fighter. They slash, they feed, they scream. This is round one of the carnage, here to celebrate the lucky from the unlucky, sprinters from the walkers, and smart from the dumb. This is where 80% of you will die. It may not even be your fault. You may get run over by a panicked bad driver, knocked over by some asshole, or shot by Sue, who hasn't fired her shotgun since the polar bear attack of 97. Car fires are also a factor for some reason I haven't figured out after watching the film 20 times. If you're a bad shot, you're dead. If you can't outsprint a vampire with the speed of Usain Bolt, you're dead. If your morality keeps you from pushing someone else down to save yourself, you're dead. Just as soon as round one starts, it's over. In less than an hour, 152 people who stayed for the polar night have been cut down to 30. Blood is everywhere, cars are on fire, windows are smashed and the vampires are getting their shriek on. <laughs> If you think you made it, congratulations. You still have 29 days of dealing with these vampires. If they don't get you, seasonal depression will. Those of you who survived round one start wondering what you're up against. These obviously aren't humans. From what you've gathered, they're either zombies or vampires. Which is it though? Let's go through what we know so far. They shriek a lot. This is common to both zombies and vampires. They seem to enjoy gorging themselves on human flesh. Again, common to both. They keep moving after being shot. Nothing definitive here and they have a really gross fingernails, which doesn't cause you to lean either way. Jeez, nothing conclusive so far. Let's see what else we know about them. First, while not particularly good looking, they don't have decomposing flesh. This is our first clue they may be vampires. Second, while zombies move fast, in addition to speed, these guys do hardcore parkour. Parkour! 
This is more in line with vampires. Finally, they were speaking to one another, which indicates a high level of cognitive function, something you usually don't see in zombies. While no one admits it openly at this point, most of you come to the conclusion that you're up against vampires. So what should you and the other survivors do? Escaping town is out of the question as all transportation has been destroyed. Calling for help is also off the menu as the vampires ensured all means of communication with the outside world are down. While someone may eventually figure out something is wrong and send help, that'll take some time. Initial attempts at fighting the vampires were ineffective at best. Outside of a headshot, they seem unaffected by gunfire, and hand-to-hand -hand combat didn't work too well for those who tried it. You may be able to find a weakness in the future, but right now you need some time to figure it out. Hiding makes the most sense. While the safest location is the metal encased utilidor, Sheriff Josh reminds everyone it is too far. One of the women mentions a hidden attic a few houses down, so you all decide to wait it out there. While you and the others head for the attic, Josh and Stella make a run to the general store for bear traps and flares to slow the vamps down. Along the way, Stella hits a vampire, bringing the truck to a stop. Stella stomps on the gas, but the wheels just spin in a mix of vampire guts and snow. Their truck is stuck, and they are surrounded. The vampires clean and jerk the truck, flipping it upside down to show off their superior strength. Just as Stella is about to be pulled out of the police truck, Bo comes to the rescue, plowing through the attacking vampires and ramming them into a wall. Chances are, he would have driven off with Stella's head as well, but her plot helmet saves her from this death. Where I'm from, snowplow drivers aren't exactly known for their accuracy. Josh, Stella, and Bo make it back to the attic where the conversation continues about what these things are. When Josh's brother finally admits what you've all been thinking, vampires, Stella immediately shoots him down, which is rebutted with evidence to the contrary. They don't fall when you shoot them. I'll add a few more reasons why they're vampires. They suck the blood of their victims, have fangs, and superhuman speed. I mean, what else do you think they are at this point, Stella? Haven't you seen Underworld, Blade, or Van Helsing? I know you've seen Twilight. Josh says that regardless of what they are, your group has two advantages. We know this town. We know the cold. I'm going to expand on those advantages, but I'm also going to balance them out with disadvantages your group of survivors will have to face. I see three additional advantages Josh did not cover. First off, this is a pretty rugged crew. A random sampling of individuals from any other U.S. city would likely die much faster. Like Josh said, you live here because no one else can. Second, you have a badass heavy machine operator who knows how to turn snow plows and trench diggers into vampire killing machines. And third, you have a mobile orchestra that alerts you to any impending danger with scary sounds. If you use this to your advantage, you may be able to escape death until the very end. Now for the disadvantages, and there are a lot of them. One, all communications are down so you can't place a call to Blade, Van Helsing, or any other vampire exterminator. Two, the gas and electricity have been cut off which means there is no heat. It'll get cold, like 40 degrees below zero cold. There's not much insulation in that attic so I hope you wore layers. Three, the vampires also turned off the water, so you're going to start dehydrating quickly. Four, while the town has enough food for everyone, you're stuck in the attic and can't risk pillaging for food. Five, while this is a pretty rugged crew, a few individuals like this old man with memory issues are going to pose a problem. That's it, I think I covered all the disadvantages. Cutting to the scene where, oh wait, I almost forgot, you have one more disadvantage. You're up against freaking vampires. They possess superhuman speed, strength, smell, hearing, and vision. Most have lived many lives, making them better than you in just about every way. Unless Unless you've got UV bullets, they don't go down without a headshot, and any damage you do will heal quickly. You are all screwed. Well, that's great. That's just fucking great, man. Now what the fuck are we supposed to do? As the days stick by, you become more stressed, sleep deprived, hungry, and dehydrated. All factors that increase the chances of hypothermia. The limited water you brought up to the attic has probably run out. Even if you could make it downstairs, there's no water coming out of the faucet due to the vamp shutting off the town's water supply. Worst of all, it's going to start smelling up there, as eventually someone's going to need to poop. Even without hypothermia, the smell of feces, dehydration, and sleep deprivation are going to manifest 
manifest as changes in behavior in your group. Confusion, anger, violent outbursts are all likely given your mental and physical health. The older someone is, the more susceptible they are to these dangers. The oldest man in your group, already suffering from memory issues, starts to showcase how he's going to be a contributing factor in you not surviving this event. This guy's gonna get someone killed, just you wait. As you sit there shivering, you hear vampires below ransacking the place looking for humans. They don't see the hidden attic, so they continue on to the next house. Except, that's not what would have happened. Let me remove your plot armor for a second and point out that vampires have an incredible sense of smell. If they entered the house, they likely would have smelled you in the attic and finished off round two of the carnage. But we'll go ahead and assume they had a stuffy nose and let you live for another day or two. As the vamps leave the house, the group disagrees on whether to continue hiding or make a run for it. After a whisper-filled fight, they decide to wait for a blizzard, which will give them the cover they need to make a run to the general store, pick up supplies, and then head for the Utilidor. While waiting for the blizzard, your group is baited out by a woman wandering the street calling for help. This is a reminder that not every human is on your side. This woman made the conscious decision to lure out her fellow townspeople to be slaughtered in return for her own survival. <laughs> As she continues her siren song, the first wannabe hero in your group rushes to save her before properly scanning the area to notice signs of a trap. Without Josh Hartnett stopping him, he would have rushed in the street alerting the vamps to your location. For some reason, Josh still tries to rescue the lady that just made a deal with the vamps to get you all killed. However, before he can get to her, she returns to the vamps empty-handed. Now I know it's easy to call out this lady's selfish move, but if we're being honest, some of you would have made the same deal and that's another reason why you wouldn't survive 30 days of night. Like her, you would have learned the hard way that vampires are easily disappointed. While Josh's attempt to rescue the young woman failed, he does come across another survivor hiding under a house. As Josh goes to save him, the guy goes full vampire. His thirst overpowers what remains of his humanity and he lunges for Josh's throat. If not for a well-placed swing set, Josh would have died. Instead, he has enough time to remind the producers of Axemen Alaska why he should have been cut in the final round of auditions. He wipes the vampire blood off his new weapon and runs back to the attic. Remember when I said the old guy is going to get someone killed? Yeah. While everyone is sleeping, he sneaks out of the attic with the intention of walking to Wainwright, a town 80 miles away. Stella chases after him, knowing his noisy exit could reveal their hideout. Just before he bursts through the front door, Stella, with the aid of the old man's son, restrain him and calm him down. Or so they think. This sly old man fools them into believing he needs a bathroom break and escapes through the window. In a rush to save his dad, his sons goes after him, pushing Stella away as he runs for the front door. <laughs> Ouch! I tend to think that's going to do more than just give her a crook in the neck, but then again, I've seen some crazy chiropractic adjustments, so maybe this is just what she needed to get rid of her neck pain. While the father and son duo do attract a vampire, their continued stupidity lures the same vampire away and Josh and Stella are able to make it back up to the attic without being noticed. Finally, the blizzard is here. Now you and the other survivors have the cover you need to make your way to the general store without being noticed. However, before you get too excited about the change in the weather, let me remind you of a few things about Alaskan blizzards. First, they're unpredictable and can increase in severity at any moment. Your run-of-the-mill winter blizzard with mild 35 mile per hour winds and heavy snowfall can quickly evolve into a zero visibility nightmare with wind gusts close to 100 miles per hour and temperatures below negative 40. Knowing most of you haven't been in a blizzard, I need to elaborate on the concept of zero visibility. It means more than not being able to see. Zero visibility is associated with the loss of kinesthesia. This is a fancy way to say it causes you to lose your ability to discern position and movement in space, leading to a complete loss in balance. Add to this 90 mile per hour wind gust strong enough to knock over a 200 pound man and you can start to see how it may be a little harder than you thought to make it to the general store. Your group is malnourished and dehydrated, leaving you physically weak. In your current state, the loss of visibility, extreme cold, and powerful wind gusts would claim at least one victim. Mother Nature is a competitive woman and will use this blizzard to show you the vamps aren't the only things you should worry about. Those of you who make it to the general store start shopping for essential supplies. Medicine, canned goods, propane, and Oreos. As your group is shopping, you notice a little vampire girl feasting on her latest victim. I'm 
done playing with this one. You want to play with me now? She attacks and one of you manages to spray her in the face with bear mace. While vampire mythology seems to differ on whether vampire anatomy would be susceptible to pepper spray, this film shows us it's not that effective. The rest of your crew rallies to pin her against the wall. It's time for someone to step up to the plate and behead the little girl. Would you do it? Of course you'd have mixed feelings, but you did just see the girl slurping up blood from a still conscious woman. If you don't act fast, she may kill Stella, Josh, or someone else. While you're still trying to decide if you should do it, Josh's brother comes in hot with the axe. With just two swings of the blade, he scores his first vampire kill. This family really knows how to use an axe. Fully supplied, the next step is making it to the police station, a temporary stop before you make the final push to the utilidor. The blizzard is over, so you need another diversion to provide cover. Stella finally comes around to the fact that you're up against vampires and proposes a plan. The grow room, supplying Josh's brother and mom with their supply of marijuana, has ultraviolet lights. If you can lure the vampires into the house, you can use the lights to effectively bring daylight early and kill some vampires. Josh volunteers to be the diversion, and the group group once again splits up. As you and the others make the run for the police station, Josh catches the vampire's attention as he heads to the garage to start the generator. One, two, three pulls and the generator starts up. That was way too easy. Countless horror movies have taught me that anything with an engine will not start before scary things arrive. If you had been the one carrying out this mission, you would have died in the garage cranking away as some vampire slit your throat. But because we need our handsome male lead to make it to the end, the engine fires up and he runs into the house to position the light. The main vampire seems skeptical about walking in the front door, but not too skeptical as he sends his lover in to investigate. Right as she opens the door, Josh hits her with some UV light, barbecuing her face. That is one bad sunburn. Before Josh can fry any more vamp faces, they cut the power and he is once again on the run. However, he can't get back without a diversion. We now need a diversion to rescue our initial diversion. If you haven't picked up on it by now, this movie is just one long sequence of diversions. Bo attracts the vampire's attention as he bears down on them with another piece of heavy machinery. While the snowplow was pretty good vampire killer, it can't compete with the effectiveness of the trencher. This 15 ton killing machine goes to work sawing vampires in half while Bo takes out approaching vampires with a shotgun. Those who do make it onto the vehicle experience the pain of stepping on a bear trap. Then Bo steers the trencher into a building. I have no idea why he does this. Between the saw on the front and the bear traps on the back, Bo could have taken out half the vampires himself. But I agree we need to kill him off as he is actually increasing your chances of living through this night. Nightmare. After crashing his trencher, his shotgun runs out of ammo. He's left with one flare and a box of dynamite. He knows his life is over, and he's going to take as many vamps with him as possible. As they swarm the building, he ignites the TNT and blows himself away with several other vampires. <laughs> Back at the police station, we learn one member of your group has been bitten. He reveals it himself and asks for a mercy killing. This is a stand-up guy. He's willing to die so you all can survive. I think this is plausible. In a situation like this, there would be moral and courageous individuals like him. However, as we saw earlier, there would also be individuals willing to sacrifice others to save themselves. For example, the woman that tried baiting out you and the remaining survivors so she could be spared. If someone like her were to be bitten, she likely wouldn't have told you until it was too late. Someone like her would have kept it under wraps until she went full vampire and ripped out someone's throat. Again, your fellow humans are just one more reason why you wouldn't survive. That brings us to the end of round two. There are five of you left. After Josh racks up kill number two, your group notices the sheriff's deputy, Billy, signaling from his house. You, Josh, and Stella run over to see if he is okay. When you get there, you make a horrific discovery. He mercy killed his entire family. He decided a bullet to the head was better than taking their chances against the vampires. Unsolicited mercy kills are a staple of round three, when all hope is lost. You better hope this guy doesn't decide to deal out some mercy to you. You, Josh, Stella, and Billy go back to the police station and find no one there. The group must have left for the utilidor. You decide to meet them there and head out. Using crawl spaces as your cover, you notice the little girl walking 
walking by. Alarms start going off as your head as you remember the other little girl in the general store. <laughs> Stella, who hasn't learned anything about vampire traps or vampire children, goes to get the kid alerting a vampire to your location. As it approaches, Josh creates yet another diversion, allowing you all to make a run for the Utilidor. Billy decides to split off from the others and make a run for the Utilidor himself. Knowing the vampires are all over, he decides to skirt the town to the outside. Billy figures this gives him the best chances of making it. On face value, this seems like a good plan, and something you would probably consider as well. However, there is something just as scary as vampires waiting for Billy on the outside of town. Hungry wolves not fully satisfied after eating Liam Neeson. See, wolves are very common in Alaska, especially during the early 2000s when this film is set. During this time, restrictions had been placed on hunting wolves that led to a surge in their growth. In addition to their normal prey, they started looking for additional sources of sustenance. Food left outside, domesticated animals, and even humans were added to the menu. In 2010, a woman named Candace Burner, out for a jog, was mauled to death by a pack of Alaskan gray wolves. With each successful attack like this, they became bolder until restrictions were lifted, bringing population levels back to normal. Wolves have a sense of smell 100 times better than humans. Additionally, the smell of blood activates their predator instincts. Drawn to the town by hunger and the smell of blood, they'd likely be waiting for some poor sap like Billy to come along. Billy's weakness would quickly be assessed, and he'd end up as wolf doo-doo a day later. Josh makes it back to the utilidor where he finds that while you made it, Stella and the little girl are missing. While he's figuring out what to do, the vampires start to cover their tracks. They open the pipeline and light the oil on fire to destroy the town and all evidence of their existence. The fire also starts to endanger Stella and the little girl who are hiding under a truck that will soon be taken over by the flames. They can't run though as the vampires surround the truck. At this point, Josh makes his boldest move yet and injects himself with vampire blood. He reasons that if he can use the increased strength and agility before the thirst for blood overwhelm him, he can save the remainder of the town. He shoots himself up with the performance enhancer and goes after the remaining vampires. This sets the stage for the final showdown between the alpha human and alpha vampire. While not a sanctioned UFC fight, this is going to be one entertaining matchup. Josh comes out swinging and lands a jab and a cross followed by a face kick. Marlo, the lead vampire, counters with some classic head slams against the hood of a nearby car, followed by a face kick of his own. He then claws at Josh's face, which is a blatant rule violation. Josh goes for his legs and gets him on the ground. They continue to exchange blows until Marlo breaks Josh's wrist. Preparing to finish off his opponent, Marlo winds up for the kill. He takes flight, and right as he's about to KO Josh, Josh lands a punch so powerful that it travels through Marlo's head. With their leader dead, the other vampires retreat back to the ship. Josh has done the impossible. He has defeated the vampires and ensured the safety of Stella, you, and the other survivors. That's pretty much how the original movie ends. But I promised you no one would see sunlight again, and I keep my promises. It's time to write an alternate ending. Before I get to that though, there's one thing you should know. The Polar Night in Alaska is not 30 days long. The film got this part wrong. The Polar Night is actually 66 six days long in Barrow, Alaska. Contrary to what Annie said, the sun is not coming up tomorrow. Josh, unaware of the writer's mistake, is now quickly turning into a vampire. His extreme exhaustion from the fight and need to heal has hastened his conversion. His need to feed overwhelms him, and before he knows what's happening, he slaughters Stella and the little girl. In a bloodthirst-driven rage, he comes back to the Utilidor to feed off you and the remaining humans, finishing off all survivors. Josh replaces Marlo is the new leader of the vampire clan, and they head down to Wainwright for seconds. And roll credits. I hope you enjoyed my glass half empty analysis of why you wouldn't survive 30 days of night. If you'd like me to expand on your inability to survive other horror movie scenarios, consider subscribing. I plan on making a video like this every week or two. Thanks for watching, and remember to live life to the fullest. If something like this happens, you're not going to make it.